from Boca Raton, Florida, Rabbis Ephraim Goldberg, Philip Moskowitz, and Josh Brody are taking you Behind the Bema. The BRS rabbis schmooze about contemporary issues and talk to special guests who give a behind-the-scenes look at how they got to where they are and what keeps them going. Welcome to Behind the Bema. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is 9 p.m. on Wednesday night. I'm Rabbi from Gober, joined by my dear friends and colleagues, Rabbi Philip Moskowitz and Rabbi Joshua Brody, and we're here to take you behind the bima. We are here to take you behind the bima. It is another Wednesday night. We are so excited to be together with you. We have a phenomenal guest on tonight, David Lichtenstein. Always interesting, fascinating, brilliant. You never know which direction we're going to go, next direction he's going to go. Very excited to be able to welcome him soon. But before that, Gentlemen, how was your week? How are you both doing? Rabbi Moskos, big week for you. Big simcha, Baruch Hashem, making a bas mitzvah for my daughter Shana this uh, this coming weekend. And as we know from COVID, every simcha was always spectacular. But now post-COVID, you appreciate every opportunity to be together with family and to celebrate a simcha. And so despite the fact that it is going to be thunderous rains all weekend here in Florida. We are enormously <laughs> grateful to the Gishmei Bracha. That's right. We've already made plans to stay across the street at my mom so we can come to this uh, bar mitzvah. Gishmei Bracha. Shane is going to break our streak of bringing a Baal Simcha on, unless she's showing up soon in your office. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe. We're still working Gish- on it. Shana is Kishmachi. Kishmachachi. She's a Shana beautiful young lady. You should have a lot of nachas from her. Um, Amazing. what else is going on this week, Rabbi Brody? It's lots of good stuff. We're, Rabbi Brody, uh, your office opening up anytime soon? It's <laughs> opening soon. They actually did announce Federation is going to be opening the building. They're actually redoing all the, the offices, which is really nice. So we don't get a good back. Time to start. Yeah, it's been closed. No, they've been weeks. redoing them. That's good. It's really nice, and everyone's very excited to come back. Awesome. And uh, no, thank God, there's a lot of, lot of action, but there's even more action on some of the other fronts. So we're working on some very, very exciting. We're, exciting, we're excited. Uh, are yeah. you gonna break? Are you gonna break the news here on behind? That's the some email? breaking news. Yeah, we actually just organized a very, very exciting meeting with, uh, with the best, really the best. It doesn't get any bigger than this. I can't say who it is, but it's someone that actually was very involved in our shul. Maybe might have been a shul president at some point. Moved to England, and you know he's got some very important family members that are working with some great, great organizations. So <laughs> I might have might have called in a nice favor. Can't there. be any less specific. Today was a fascinating <laughs> day. Once a month or so. We have our meeting of our Beisden for Conversion, our uh, rabbinical court for Geras. Um, we have a regional Beisden, which um, is connected to the Beisden of America. It's part of the GPS system, the regional Geras protocol system that's approved by the chief rabbinate of Israel around the world. And every time we do it, it's it's exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting because we essentially set aside half a day once a month. Uh, we have these meetings. When we're not paid for this. It's not part of a job description. It's a service of Klai Yisrael and those who want to join the Jewish people, and it's both exhausting and exhilarating, invigorating at the same time to sit and to meet with these candidates, people who, you know, sometimes somebody maybe has a father who's Jewish and a mother not. They grew up thinking they're Jewish, they need to convert. Sometimes somebody is in a relationship, dating, and halakhically, obviously complicated, but we navigate. We want to make sure that they, you know, they come aboard or they're married, let's say. Um, But other times it's somebody who simply has been exposed to the Jewish tradition and the Jewish vision, the Jewish values of the world, and they're like, I want part of that. I want to be part of that. And it's it's amazingly inspiring to sit, to hear, to listen to their stories, to hear their background, how they grew up, and um, sometimes some detective work, figure out why does somebody want to leave the freedom, the liberty of the world where you can be a Noahide. You could observe the seven Noahide laws, love God, be spiritual, but without all the restrictions, without a target on your back called anti-Semitism, without the price tag of Jewish day school tuition and, and the cost of Jewish meat and so on. Um, and you do that detective work. And when you come out that the person's sincere and they have the knowledge and they're socially integrated into the community, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing to see and to be part of. Rabbi Moskowitz was a sponsoring rabbi today for a candidate who is very enthusiastic and very driven. Um, and it's just, it's really exciting. It's really amazing to see. You know, it's interesting. Today we got the first time someone saying, you're welcome to come to my house anytime you want. You can crash, unannounced, surprise right. me, check up on me. I'm ready for you. And uh, I thought that was interesting that he felt so willing to open himself up to that and to invite us into his house to check up on him. 
There wasn't a conversation from today, but I'll put it out there because it's interesting that you know we make very clear that to, to be a member, to join the Jewish people, it's not an honorific, it's not a title. You can't pay for it. You don't subscribe to it. There's no fast track. You have to be sincere. You have to have the knowledge and you have to put it into practice. You've got to walk the walk. So we had candidates who've come far along and they're not asking questions. They're not entirely practicing. It's clear that they're not all in. And you say, what's going on here? You want to be Jewish. You say you want to be Jewish, but you don't seem to be fully invested. And they'll say, Rabbi, I, I want to be Jewish. Like some of your congregants are Jewish, you know, right. like, like keep kosher at home, but eat out or dress this way, but not that way. Or, you know, keep this level, but not that level. And when we have to explain that, you know, if you're born into it, it's not an all or nothing. Of course, you're a full-fledged Jew no matter what level or what you're doing, although we're always inspiring for more. But to join that casual attitude or somewhat diluted attitude, it's not a schmorg. It's not a pick and choose. It's non-negotiable. But it's an interesting thing because the the being involved in, in conversion and Gerus sort of obligates the whole community because we have to be the role models. And uh, we don't want to be in a spot where someone says, well, I want to be like them. And what do you mean? That's not good enough for me. Why is it good enough for them? And you have to start to explain. Maybe it's not. We're trying to inspire and, and people are different, but it's a very, very interesting half a day every it's month. A, it's a great point. And I'll, you know, I'll even say that the members from our community that end up studying with the conversion candidates gain as much, if not more. Aside from the fact they're having meals and they're being forced to have that kind of gut check in the mirror to their face of their observance. But just when, when you have someone from the community sit down with someone going through the process and you say, he's your guy, she's your girl, you're going to mentor her or him, you're going to shepherd them along, you're going to be responsible for their spiritual well-being, people take such pride in that. And you and I have seen this countless times where someone right. will, will join them at the day of the conversion. And as much as the convert is feeling proud, the member of our community who shepherded them along feels so great about their Judaism and they're on fire in a way that they weren't previously necessarily because they feel such pride in what they were able to give over to another person. It's an enormous commitment. It's an enormous transformation. It's an enormously restrictive life. It's enormous expense. Um, and, and you have a non-Jewish family. It makes life very complicated in the holidays, family events and experiences. And, you know, we should do more to show love. It's actually the mitzvah that's repeated more than any in the whole Torah is loving the convert and show support in whatever ways that, that we can. But it's really, it's inspiring and it's obligating um, and, and it's exhilarating, invigorating every time we, we have that, we sit down as that rabbinical court. It is also challenging and you alluded to this and I don't want to whitewash the entire experience. You know, part of the challenge, both as on my end as the sponsoring rabbi and on your end as part of the based in, but is to really sift through and, and it's a lot of detective work and it's a lot of really trying to figure out at every stage of the process, how genuine is this person? Are they practicing in their home when you're not there exactly like they tell you they are? Um, and it's really, you know, that's why it takes such a long time. Because I always tell the candidates, it's not just about the information that you know. It's about us becoming comfortable that what we see in front of us when you come into my office is exactly the person that's at home, is the mm. person who's at the gym, who's at the person at the office. And it takes a long time to gain that comfortability. You feel like you're part of something much bigger than yourself too. You know, the whole Jewish experience. We recently converted uh, several months ago and somebody not from South Florida because we try to help other areas that don't have a local uh, rabbinical court to do this. But it was it's a woman from Germany. She's a German woman. And um, it's kind of fascinating. You're curious, not necessarily appropriate to ask, where were your father and grandfather during the war? What side were they on? What did they do? Were they hiding Jews or were they turning them over? Were they part of the Nazi, the SS, or were they righteous Gentiles? And you don't ask and you're curious, but it's an amazing thing to see that somebody who might be the child or grandchild of people who lived through the greatest atrocity, the most systematic attempt to exterminate Jews is themselves now choosing to join the Jewish people and our destiny and place their lot with our lot. I wanted to bring up one other topic before we bring on our amazing guest to remember it. I actually wrote it down on our behind the Bima pad and that's the following. Today I was on a webinar, a very fascinating webinar. I'd never participated with a particular organization before and I enjoyed it very much. Um, and the organization that made up the flyer for the webinar um, chose the bio. They had my picture and underneath it they wrote Rabbi Booker's own synagogue, host of behind the Bima. So often when I'm trying to get my children to appreciate me, I'll share, hoping they'll be somewhat proud in our little family WhatsApp group, our fam jam, uh, what's going on. So I put that flyer and my kids, all of them went crazy at me. H host of Behind the Bima? That's a title you're proud of? That's part of who you are? Of all the things that you do, that's what you want to highlight? 
Who told them to put that there? You've got to get them to change that Abba. Behind the beam is fun and it's exciting and it provides a service for people who enjoy it. But of all the things you do, so I told one of my children in particular who's can be expressive and, and vociferous, I said, why don't you write up what you would want it to say? And she did. I don't have permission to read it. But I posed this question to the two of you. If someone came to you, Rabbi Moskowitz, and said, I will follow one thing that you do. I'll listen either to your Tehillim Shir or your Friday Parsha Shir or read your article or hear your Drush on Shabbos. Not the private interactions that you do. Not, I, don't, I don't mean private counseling or life cycle. In terms of your public teaching communication role, I'll follow one thing. Behind the Bima, a class, an article, a drasha. What would you answer them? What would you take pride in? What would you want them to follow? So, for, without a doubt, it would be my Tehillim class. Where we're about ninety-seven chapters in Tehillim. Um, I'm enormously proud of it. We have a great crowd that comes out. I honestly, I gain more from it than I think any of the participants. But it's an unfair question that you're asking because while I'm very proud of Tehillim, I'm also proud of my Parsha class, and I'm also proud of Behind the Bima. In other words. I think the diversity of what we offer people is specifically what makes me proud. So I don't think it's bad if someone connects to us, to our Torah, to the messages of the, of the, of the guests that we have on Behind the Bima, and that's kind of their portal of entry into the Boca Raton Synagogue, into other opportunities to learn with us, into, into, uh, into inspiration. I have no problem with that whatsoever. So it's not either or. I don't know why you're daughters I, viewed it as mutually I mean, no, my, exclusive. My daughters and I are not setting up as an either or. I'm actually very sympathetic. They were like, Abba, you're amazing. You took the Musser. I'm like, first of all, you didn't give me Musser. And second of all, I didn't take it. I agree with you to begin with. I never told them to put that on the flyer. But the reason I actually am sympathetic and agree with my with my children is because as proud as I am of Behind the Bima and as much as I think it offers and I hope it exposes people to personalities, we've all been inspired, we've been entertained, we've been educated, um, we, we represent, we share a diversity of Jews and non-Jews and observant and non-observant. We're, we're very proud of what we do, but but Behind the Bima is kind of supplementing or it is in addition to what we do. I don't know that it's the core of what we do. And well, I think I that's what they were getting life. at. And that's what I share is that if I ran into someone, often I do when I, when I go places and people say, oh, I love your bind to be my list. And I'll say, well, what else do you listen to? Do you listen? I, I would love, do you know how to access the Parsha Shear or the Amuna Shear or the Mesil Sharm Shear or the term Friday and Tarif Shabbos Shear or the Sitter Snippets? There's a lot of Torah, which is really transformational. It's not mine. I'm, I'm, I'm merit. I have the merit to, to share it from others. And I'd love you to listen to it. No, I like behind the bima. It's like good, easy listening while I'm cooking. No, no, while I'm so, so first of all, we're agreeing. We're 100 percent agreeing because I obviously I don't view this as the the essential. I view it as a portal of entry, which I know you love. But but it co- really comes back to what Jamie Geller shared last week. You know the challenge of H.com, where they said they have the edutainment where they bring people onto the website, but then it's what do you do with them afterwards? How do you get them into other more meaningful, significant learning uh, opportunities? Okay, once but we you don't people in. No, we so, don't, maybe, so I was actually saying should. that's. The benefit of this conversation is actually maybe we should. In other words, maybe we should make it explicit to everyone listening to this podcast right now. This is great. David Lichtenstein, hopefully it'll be an amazing conversation. But if you really want the meat and potatoes of what Rabbi Goldberg stands for and Rabbi Moskowitz and Rabbi Brody, go on YU Torah, go on Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg.org, read our weekly, because that's the stuff where we're giving the meaningful, in-depth, thoughtful messages for you. I guess my children were, and Rabbi Brody, I want to bring you in here. But they were concerned that it would never go to either our heads or that we would want to be represented as like the the top thing, right? Um, let, let's say there's 10 things we could be known by, including the Bayesian for conversion, the ORB, Rabbi Moskowitz on the board of school. There's a lot that we're involved in activities that we're, we're trying to play leadership roles in. Would being hosts of a popular podcast, where does that fit? And, and we should never confuse that with our core responsibilities, our core identity. And, and we're not distancing ourselves right now. I don't want to get the emails or the text messages saying, I love buying the beam and it's an important service and I may not connect to the things you do. We get that and we love that and we're going to keep doing that. But it's an interesting conversation about what's the core of what we do. Robbie Brody, what are you thinking? It's funny. I remember a few months ago we were at a wedding and someone called up, I don't know if it was you or me or co-hosts of the Behind the Beam and then there was, it wasn't just, just, um, you know, everyone let it go. There was like almost like a cheer. Like everyone got excited. Oh, look, the they all know you. They're all members of our shul. It's not like no one knows, but they, there was a certain excitement, I think. But um, I think it's also interesting because, you know, sometimes people say like, well, like, what do you want to be called up as? I'm talking about the bio. So mm-hmm. many times I'll say, and especially if you're there, I'll say, just say rabbi of Boca Raton Synagogue, you know? So 
So nice. at the end of the day, who cares? You know, you know what I always say? Fun. That's the bottom. You know line. what I always say? I said it last yeah. week. I got an email. I was at a wedding. I read the Ksuba. They said, how would you like to be called up? Yeah. I said, uh, they said, Rabbi Booker Tone Synagogue. I said, Rabbi Booker Tone Synagogue and friend of the college family. To me, the bigger compliment is friend of right. the college. But you remember, we've family. we've we've been at some weddings where one of us has been the close friend of the college family, <laughs> and one of us has been friend. <laughs> it's like right. mm, acquaintance, what was that acquaintance, about? <laughs> yeah. acquaintance of the Chassid's family, <laughs> barely talking to neighbor of the right. college family. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's an interesting conversation, one that we should continue. But now we have the great privilege of welcoming on somebody who is known by their very popular podcast. I think it's been downloaded by, by millions of people collectively, and it's only a small part of what he does. David Luxenstein is the founder and CEO of the Lightstone Group, one of the largest privately held real estate companies in the United States, an enormously successful real estate company. He's authored, even while he's done that, he's found the time to write three books of his headlines, uh, Contemporary Halakhic Analysis. He's written several volumes in Hebrew of the Mishnah Achrona, a commentary on the Mishnah Bura. He hosts the Headlines podcasts uh, weekly. I don't know how he has time to do it all. He's extraordinarily brilliant. He somehow is able to, to uh, get it all in and get it all done. And there's a lot to learn from him, and we're really excited to be able to welcome him tonight. So without any further ado, David Lichtenstein. We are honored to be joined by the great, the one and only, we are honored to be joined by the great, the one and only, Rabbi David Lichtenstein. Thank you so much for being together on Behind the Bima. It's a really honor to host you. We've had the privilege of being with you on, on headlines. And we're going to try to make some uh, headlines together today. So thank you for being with us. It's an honor, Rabbi Goldberg. So Rabbi David, you recently uh, were the keynote speaker at the Kines HaShluchim. Chabad hosted you. And uh, you spoke beautifully, really using the moment to acknowledge and to express gratitude to the shluchim around the world. What's your connection to Chabad? Why did the Kinnis, of all people, why did they invite you? It came out of the blue. Um, he called me up like a week beforehand. And um, it could be that over the years on, on our program, I think it's obvious my admiration for Chabad. I think what they, they do is is what we're going to find, right? And the Mesir Snefesh of the Shluchim is, and I'll tell you something, that where I live, we we live on a larger property in some place in the, in the Noahsville of the edge of Muncie. So we have some extra property and there's an extra house or two. And for the last while, we've, we've had Chabad Shluchim staying there who are here in America for, um, you know, they need medical assistance, right? And so I've got to meet the shluchim from remote areas on a first-hand basis and see the Masira Snefesh, which is unworldly that they go through for their shluchas. And I guess it filtered back to them that I was the spile, and that is spileless, I guess, is what caused it. Amazing. Um, and it's a beautiful chesed you do for them, so thank you for that. Headlines, your big radio show, your can, podcast. Can I, can I say something to our wonderful audience? Sure. You know, I'm not a Chabad. I'm, I'm a Litvak, right? Um, I'm not a Misnagid, but I'm a Litvak. I went to all the great Litvish yeshivas. I mean, you name them, you know, the big, great, <clears throat> the usual suspect. But they came here and um, they believe the say that the uh, the Tzayis talks about in Kuf Pei Beis, I believe it's Kuf Pei Beis, and the Tzayis is read, etc. Is they believe they live it, and when they came here, I felt when they moved in that the shula came to our property. Wow, powerful. Yeah, I, 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 I told my wife there are times I walk back in the back like we have a share a common garden. I said, I sense like the scent of Ganeden. Wow. Do you That's... feel like the that the yeshivish world is 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 having more of an admiration now for Chabad? Do you feel like uh, on the inner circles there's more of a, of I th a respect? I think that the internet to a certain extent breaks down barriers and. It's very easy to, you know, be fearful of others when we don't know who they are. We actually, when, when we cross and we see that they have, you know, 99% of their experiences are ours, you know, they live with 
you know, fear, where will the kids be? Are they doing the right shlichas? Do they have the right mission? Have they found their shleimahs? I mean, that's so much of their issues and our issues are the same and a little bit maybe a different dialect, but pretty much the same. I think that maybe that allows for um, barriers to somewhat crumble. So, you know, I, I hate to be, I'm, I certainly don't see myself as a spokesperson for any particular group. Certainly the issue, you know, the Haredi world, which, you know, I grew up in, but I don't know, they, they certainly, I don't, I don't feel like a spokesperson for them, but I could tell you that, look, you know, when Rabashkin was in trouble, I mean, they raised more funds for him in, in Lakefield and Williamsburg than they did in Crown Heights, right? Um, it would, it's like almost unheard of, you know, and, um, so is, do you see that as some somewhat of a an, an indicator of changing of times? It could be. It's not a bad thing, I think, you know. We're all brothers. I think as the world is changing around us and is getting further and further from our values, then we who share more in common than we have differences are able to focus more on our commonality. And we're seeing that come together, which which is a perfect transition to, to headlines. Headlines, your podcast that you can share with us the statistics that you know. You know, the downloads are in the millions and people listen all over the world. And from your vantage point as the host of, of Headlines, you speak to Jews uh, of all backgrounds and you really have representation of the gamut of the Shivan Panam Torah, whom you interview and you involve. And um, what is what has surprised you? What have you learned about the Jewish people through Headlines? Has, has anything surprised you about a particular guest who represented a view that took you off guard or you didn't predict or anticipate about them? Is there a guest that stands out in all the years of doing it who was different than you thought they would be? What's amazing is you're able to host on the same program, you know, very simple people and Gedola Yisrael and Major Poskim who ordinarily wouldn't appear on such types of programs. And from that perch, from that perspective, you really see a big picture of the Jewish people. What are some of the trends you've seen? What are the things that have surprised you? Share a little bit of behind the beam about the show headlines. I think that <clears throat> Some of the things that you become more aware of is the, the power of the individual. And one of the more remarkable conversations I've had is with a fellow by the name of Rabbi Eckstein. I forget his first name, um, but he he was the founder of Dar Yisharim, <clears throat> and he told us the story of how. When his first child was born, they were besimcha and they made a shalom zacher and a bris and they named after the grandparent. And then like 10 months later, the kid, child acting, they took him to the doctor. He said, it's, he has hay sex and it's terminal. And he put it into the hospital, um, it was a hospital, Kingsbridge Jewish Medical, that was a hospital that had a big hay sex ward. And you put the kid in there and the kids died at three or four or five, whatever. He said it was a wait to get in because there were so many kids with tay sex and they they wept and then they had another kid and at 10 months old the second kid the same thing happened and they tried to get that kid into kingsbridge and there was now like a year wait because <clears throat> you know people check in but they don't check out and so you know, the child to, and then he said it and then they had a third kid and then they went all over again and he said he like a terrible blackness gripped him and his wife. And he said he became, he just couldn't function. And he replied and he said, I'm going to do something about it. And he said, when I was there, when they had that full good Jewish hospital, people said, there were no more Tay-Sachs children to go there anymore. And I've heard that story from other people as well. Like, you know, similar stories, like from... Simcha Scala, who I went to Yeshiva with, and honestly, I mean, he was an ordinary guy. And he found his high lifeline. And he said, just spectacular work. And you say, Simcha, how did you do that? So I see time and time again, what, is it, what does the Navi say? Echad Hayavram. The power of the individual, like, you know, the lone Chinese citizen standing in front of the tanks and the entire procession comes to a halt. And I've seen by us, I mean, we just spoke about the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I mean, look at one man dead. And I look at the tribe of five old dead. And 
I think all this speaks to how we as individuals, you know, we can't make an impact, really. Look, look at the impact that your contemporaries, not a problem with 3,700 years ago, and Aram Narayan, but people today have done. And I think there's something very spiritual and beautiful about that. That is powerful. Yeah. Well, what, are you, what are you most proud of? Um, headlines, the broadcast, did it, did it see it any change? Did you get feedback that there was a conversation on headlines that actually moved the needle among the Jewish people on a particular topic? Is there an episode of headlines that jumps out to you that you're the most proud of for having hosted that conversation? So, I, I really don't let my ego get involved in it. I doesn't talk to me. No, I'm just, um, I've been down that road. I always say like ego, sugar, and cocaine. All very dangerous, very powerful, very expensive. Um, is about, you know, I left yeshiva. I had to go to work. You know, we were, I didn't want to take welfare, food stamps. I just, my parents, my in-laws and my parents were very wealthy people. But they didn't have any money. So, uh, every yeshiva boy, at least when I went to yeshiva, we, we all wanted to be malam, and we wanted to be marbitz taira. So to me, headlines is a way of being a marbitz taira. So I did it in the format that it is. It was just out of <clears throat> experience. I mean, the shul that I'm in, they first they said, would you say a shear Shabbos? I came and I said a fabulous shear about, I don't know, Boyer, you know, the hundred and there were six people there and five people were snoring 10 minutes in. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe they didn't like Boyer. So I, I said, well, let's go to Chayshu Mishpah. Right, so I picked, you know, Hilchas uh, Karkois. I don't know. I, you know, I learned. I didn't learn through many of these sugyas, and then, I, and everybody was snoring then, and it was, and it was before Purim, like, the, and it was about to close down because he went from like ten guys to nine guys to eight guys to seven guys to six guys, and so I said, you know, there was an article in the paper how the Arabs accused the Jews of using honey pots, soldiers to get, you know, evidence to get information. So I said, look, Esther Karka Elam, could you use to Israel halach if they came to a rav? And they said, we think we're in danger in Iran. Can a, a woman have an affair with an Iran a nuclear bomb, you know, a physicist to get information or not? And suddenly nobody fell asleep and everybody was there. And I said, hey, maybe, you know, I just, <clears throat> you know, I was in YU for a Shabbos. So you're speaking about, you know, learning, um, like, you know, how about I mean, it's honestly has a Korea. It's like pretty boring stuff for your average yeshiva boy. So, okay, I'll say Sharon has a Korea. I said, you know, ring thermos, ring um, doorbell is being sued. Why? This guy had ring, you know, it's the doorbell. You put it up yeah. and it shows you who's by the door and this and that. And Amazon, of course, does a great job like they do with everything. So a guy was showing his neighbor how on his iPhone, he could see by the door and he's showing her. He says, look, there's you. And she's like a hundred feet away. And she's talking to somebody. He says, look, you could even hear the conversation. And he presses a button and she, they're talking to each other from 100 feet. So she sued them and they sued Amazon. But I said, has it Korea? Would you be allowed to put up a ring thing? Could I as a neighbor took you to bed then? Or the, all those cameras around your properties, you could see right into your neighbor's windows. Well, halacha, can I take you? What's the dinam harchak? I said, thank you. You're the dying. I say, I want you to take your cameras down. I want you to take your ring down. You're being mad with me. How would you pass in? So according to the rush, it's more of a Shiloh. If you learn like the Ram, oh, suddenly it's a whole different sugya, right? So I found that when you take halacha de topics and you make them real, right? Suddenly everybody looks at the Torah that it's not a, some type of, a, you know, a archaic document, but it's very hard to find almost any topic in halacha that is not, you can't address through you know, the, the Gemara, Rishayin, and Machrein, and you know, from the Paiskim, Shach, Taz, whatever it is, right? And so, and, and, and I think people are fascinated by how does the Torah intersect mo mostly halachically into our lives. <laughs> but so there's a Machleik is going on in, in, in New York now. See, this is splitting into pieces, right? Kids are being thrown out of school well, halachically. I'm my lad, with parents sign a document. Can you enforce that document? Say, look, just read what you signed. 
It's a document. Wait, but there's a problem. Why? You know, the child is on the document. Well, he didn't sign the document. Can you enter into an agreement with a third party without their consent? So does, would Besden or the society have a fiduciary to their child? I mean, if the two parents agreed to kill the kid, are they allowed to do it that way? Clearly not. And suddenly it becomes very interesting. You know, what are the obligations? What are the obligations? Do parents ish becheta yumas? Are kids responsible? Should I get thrown out of school because my mother grew long red nails or whatever she, whatever she did? She started to wear mini skirts or maybe no skirts. I mean, what is my, what's my responsibility? So you want to do it for your school, but the child is there. Halachically, we have an obligation to defend him. When I say society, right? That's a different show than Gamla. We all have a chiv. Bezdin chayiv lamayla. Well, if you're the Bezdin and I come as a fiduciary, I, John Doe, what would you pass in? And when you start bringing the halach into it, it becomes, instead of just a, a Jewish press yenta conversation, it becomes a real conversation. People become, makes the halacha and, shul, and everything we learn in yeshiva more powerful and relevant. Mm. No, that's good. If I could just ask a follow up, Rabbi Goldberg had mentioned the perch that you have, the ability to see different worlds based on the guests that you have on your show. As someone who clearly has a foot in multiple worlds, um, what do you think each world can kind of learn from one another? What can the yeshivish world learn from the more modern Orthodox world? What can the modern <laughs> Orthodox world learn from the yeshivish world? Assuming we all hate the titles and we use them only for uh, simplicity purposes, but what could each world learn from one another? Um, well, one thing the yeshiva world has, which I think is powerful, and, and, and I speak to it through the prism where I come from, so it's, I don't speak against the yeshiva world, but I think that the yeshiva world produces a lot of pride and they believe that it's real. And you know, every child could be a gadol, could be a Rebbe Kivega. What they do, there is Tyra Lishma is the most powerful thing, is the most important thing. And I'll tell you a story. My Shor Zuchan Lebracho had a yeshiva based Shraga. And my mother was the Rebbetzin of the Beis Yaakov here for decades and decades and decades. Over 50 years. I remember for the last nine years they lived by us. So a girl came once. My mother, she was a world expert in digduk. She did the digduk in the Ramban, the art scroll. They, they came to her. She was like one of the. So this girl was struggling and she was very frustrated. So my mother told her, you know, what's that's how far her, her, her teaching experience got. So I, I, when I became a son-in-law there, they lived in a house. Oof. There were no, there were 10 chairs around the dining room table. I think two were from the same set. Why was it going on? Beishraga had a lot of it was a little bit more of like a, it was a, like a, a little bit more European. So for some reason, Moshe Reichman sent his kids there. So I come for a Shabbos and I'm sitting on one of their off thing chairs by the Shabbos table. And somebody commented that he had come in on Thursday, he flew in with his private jet, met with his son for now and flew back out. Now, I couldn't help, even then I was a numbers sort of, they just in my, I did a quick calculation. I said to my mother, I said, you know, that jet cost him more than what you earn in a year. And that makes me feel bad, this trip back and forth. And I remember her looking at me and going, like, with astonishment, I would never trade places with him. This is what he means, I considered the wealthiest five men in the world, I would never trade places with them. And I think that the yeshiva world does give us kifas on, you know, the value of Tyra, how the whole world, that what we have is invaluable and there's nothing that compares to it. And you know, it's this week's Parsha. It says, um, Yaakov says to Asa, Yeshli Koyal. I have everything. I don't need anything. There's nothing you could give me. And then the Yaakov Allah Lodarkai. Right? 
you can up chapin for our Asa when when can we truly separate ourselves when we say we don't need anything from you we're not Matana, not your Yale and not your Harvard and not your Longfellow and not your there's nothing there's nothing when we could say Yeshli Kyl at that point Kem is up chapin we could go our own way and I think that the yeshiva world has done that well um, I certainly, for me, you know, there's a story that Alta from Slobodka had a Talmud to went off the derech. So they say he told his Talmud, there's one thing you can be certain. Yes, by me. me. Right. Hanaf from Eilam Hazay, you're not going to have anymore. Right. I think that. And I think that to a certain extent, you know, the, the world that is more integrated, the Wayu world, that because of the their which is with the, and they have something very to be proud of as well but because there is a synthesis over there with with the outside world and there's more of a knowledge so there's more of the ability to be in a spoil from it and i think that that's a message that we can take from the yeshiva world and really i think the yeshiva world doesn't lose that many guys because of that like you know like with for that, I'm going to give up something. Like for this person, I should be in a smile from him or from them. And I think that the the YU world has a has like a fabulous message too, which I relate to, which is that again, our parsha. You know, you had two children. You had Esav, and he had Yaakov. Esav was the Ish Sada. Yaakov was the Ishtam. So already the Chidu Sharim says. And, I think it's brought in Sheshek. He says, you know, Yitzhak is looking towards the future of Klal Yisrael, everything that it encompasses. And Yitzhak is saying, you know, when we Megayar Aguirre, you say, you have to tell them, by the way, you should know, Rambam Minochel says, sorry, be it, so the test of zip code, he says, you know, you should know that Klal Yisrael, Tchuyim, Sufim, Redufim, there's a big target on your back. So Yitzhak says, you know, I'd rather teach the Koyal Yachel, Esav, how to learn than to try to teach the Yeshiva Bacha how to pick up a gun. That's right. I don't think I'm far off. And he wanted the model of the, the Jew who has a, the Gemara in one hand and a gun in the other hand, or an arrow, whatever it may be. In other words, we should survive. And, and also, when he tells Yaakov, he says, um, he says, how do you miser? Melech. I think it's like, it's a strange request. I think he's saying Melech is what's Makayim, everything. He's saying, remember, I'm the Melech of the world. I mean, you know, what is it? Hamoine Shalraimi runs the world, the Gemara says, right? The Western civilization is thing. But Yaakov, on the other hand, when he steals the brachas, how does he get the Birchas Esav, Birchas Yitzchak? Is when he's wearing the Levush of Esav. That's when he gets the blessing to, to live in this world. Sometimes when I go out to work, I tell my wife, I'm going to have like a meeting. These last two years, not too many of them, but I used to go, you dressed in like some triple thing. I tell my wife, I'm going with my big day Asim now. Right? But that's how, we, that's how we go to the world. It's only. And when you look at Yaakov, who's the son that he loved? Yosef Mikol Banov. And what's the next Pasik? Yosef has a dream. What's the first dream? Remember, agriculture then was what apple is today. People spent most of their lives just the yud alaf malachas hapas to make a piece of bread. First, you plow, you plowed it with a horse or a cow, whatever it is. Then you put in the seed, and then you threw it up in the air. I mean, it was crazy, right? The yud alaf, right? So ma'alma malumim. He says, my bundle's the biggest. I they didn't have irrigation. I had the biggest. I'm the Steve Jobs of of society. That's what Yaakov, you, the first dream is, right? But then what's the next dream? All the celestial bodies are bowing to me. So you know what that means, right? So this is Yaakov's to his dreams. And what does the next Pasik say? Right? The Yaakov Shamar es Hadavar. Yaakov hears the two dreams. He hears the right of who is on one hand, Shemesh Vayareach, on the other hand, he feeds the world, which he ultimately does. And Yaakov is, Ohav is Yosef, why? I believe that Yaakov sees in Yosef what Yitzchak in 
in that moment, that artificial moment, saw in him. Which was the current Koyaka. Given your daim, your deyeso. I think that... At least theoretically, because I can't say I, I, I live in that world. I live sort of, I honestly live in my own little world. But at least the concept is a very holy concept. And I think that, you know, as Lakewood and, and well, the yeshiva world, the more successful, and, you know, we can't have Kyle, used to be Kyle for everybody at this point, you know, it's going to be a million from Eden in America. We can't have a quarter of a million people. As we go out, I think there's something to really look at that and say, how do we live in two worlds? How do we live in two worlds? It was just Rosh Hashiva gave a speech, a fiery speech. Somebody said to me about how he was in a town with a coil and 20 guys have private jets and they're flying and they're buying charcuterie boards for thousands of dollars. And, you know, living in two worlds is a very complicated, complicated thing. And I think in that respect, YU has, you know, many, many years edge on the yeshiva world. And we could look to it. Many of them have done it successfully and admirably. So I think each, each, every one of them has had success that we could learn from each other. Uh, I want to follow up on something that you said earlier about the ego, sugar, and cocaine. Because that was a very powerful yeah. insight that you said very quickly in passing. The ego, sugar, yeah. and cocaine. So what, what would your message be to people who've tasted success and then they, then they uh, were set back, then they had a failure? Then they lost all the success that they had and they built themselves up again. Uh, what would a message be to somebody who's hit that wall, the proverbial wall or a literal wall? They lost all they had. They had to declare bankruptcy. They had to rebuild. They had to start from scratch. They had success once they believed in themselves and they were humbled by, by that failure. Could you speak more about the danger of the ego? And even after the ego is, is crushed a little bit or after we hit that wall, how can people find the resiliency to keep going and to, to be the best they can be, to break through and, and succeed again? Well, I think that as students of the Tyra, right? I mean, the Tyra is, it's not an art scroll, hey, geography, right? Um, look, let's, let me use like a, a sort of a very simplified and almost crude example, but look at, look at the, the Melech HaMashiach. Look at his lineage, right? He starts off with Light and his daughters. I mean, just start with Light. Can we think of a more imperfect, fractured person than Light? To the point that the word Light in, in Aramaic means a klala. He has almost a cursed life, right? Um, <clears throat> he's, he's Avram's Yairish. And then he runs to Sadaim. Falls into the deepest... You know, the anti Sodom is a one time event, anti Chesed, Zelu Mazei, Avram Oilam Chesed Yiban. He goes to the anti Chesed, but something remains, something very twisted, and he gives his daughters out for Znus. And then with his own children, he has, look, the, his, his children are Mamzerim, Lahalacha, right? The children of incest. This is the beginning of the story of, of Geula. I mean, really, what's Mashiach? It's the story of coming to our ultimate enlightenment, our ultimate personal redemption. And then what's the next step is Yehuda and Tamar. Right? And then the next step is we see um, of, the, of the, the path to Geula is with Rus and crawling into the bed of, uh, of uh, help me here. Boaz. By by us, right? I mean, she crawls into. I mean, which base Yaakov girl is going under his covers, Lamar Loisa, right? And then we have <clears throat> which Shloima, David. David sees a beautiful woman, has the husband killed so that he can have a child with her. And this is Shloima, and from this comes the Melech Hamashiach. I mean, what's the message? It's it, the what's the pathway to Geula? It's going to be difficult and it's going to be fractured. And you know what? We just stumble our way right into the light. Just, just, keep, just never stop. Stum, stumble your way to the top. That's the story of Moshiach. Stumble your way to Mount, the top of Mount Everest, but never give up. Just keep going. That, that's our story. That's the. I mean, they say Sheva Yipol Tzad, but the Jewish story is about just stumbling to the top, but to the top. And that's what I say. I say that. If you're Jewish and you believe the story of the Torah, or even if you're not Jewish and you believe the story of redemption and Geula, that's the story. 
But how do you apply it personally, right? I know you don't want to speak personally. I admire that because that's that's feeding that that dangerous crack cocaine called the ego. But how can how can we learn from it, right? So people look at David Lichtenstein, they Google your name, and they say, enormously successful businessman, <clears throat> brilliant author, speaker, host <clears throat> of a very popular show, by all the externalities, measures as a as a success. Uh, they don't necessarily know the challenges. They don't know the bumpy road along the way, the Mashiach background that you just described. So how can you give chizik to the person who only sees the final product? It's not a final, Baruch Hashem, there's a long way to go, but who only sees the success on the outside and doesn't realize that that success takes enormous effort. It took struggle. It took tension. It took failure in order to bounce back and succeed. What would you say to the yeshiva bach who's trying to build a career in business, hasn't yet broken through? The person who built a career successfully stumbled and is trying to rebuild after having hit some resistance. Aside from the general story of the Jewish people in Tanakh, personally from your story, what would your message be? What are the ingredients to succeed? What are the things to remember every day? What are the um, character character traits to exhibit? So let me let me share with you, uh, there was a Kotzke Chassid, and they came to him in the base Medrash, and somebody very worried looking, trying to figure out how to phrase it. And he said, you know, Remendel, we'll give him the name, Mendel, even though the Kotzka Rebbe was Mendel. He says, your, your house burned down. Now, in those days, pre-insurance, when a person's house burned down, that means he lost everything, unless he was a wealthy person. So this Kotzka Chassid got up, and he made a bracha, Baruch HaTu Hashem Alekeinu Melech HaElam, Shaloi Asani Gai. So they said, Remendel, Shaloi Asani Gai? He said, if I would be a pagan, right, my God would have burned down too. Mm. Hmm. Right? And I think that as, as Yidin, I mean, I think resilience is about putting a cushion between you and pain and shock and trauma, right? And I think that as Yidin, it's, or, 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 as, or as spiritual people, because well, let me not make it up. I think that the first recognition is, is that, what are you? You're a businessman. You're not a businessman. You're, first of all, you're an Eved Hashem. You're a father. You're a parent. You're a husband. You support your yeshivas. You support the community. You're a Baal Chesed. You're a native. I mean, so the, the education that we should be giving our children or ourselves is that I live in so many worlds. So this particular trauma, it's like if you take a, I, I'll share with you a fascinating story. And I forgot his name in India was a Yid who fled the Holocaust. And he, um, he became, a, he ate vegetables his entire life. And so what happened was, because again, we have, we have Chaylam by us. So we had a fellow, he was from the Israeli army, he was dying, he had implanted a chip, he was a spy, whatever. And his father came, stayed with us in the process, ultimately he died. And he shared a fascinating story. He went to India to hear what this guy had to say. Fascinating. So he said, he went to him and he said, you know, I lost my son and I can't live anymore. He says, what would you tell me? And then he asked me, he says, why does God do such terrible things? And this guy who was fled the Holocaust, who had lost everybody, he said, I don't know of anything bad that God did. And I'm telling you a story that's on a high level, but we can apply it somewhat. He said, but, but what do you mean? I lost my son. So he said, if you take a pebble and you drop it into a, a glass, it makes waves. But if you take a huge boulder and you drop it into the Indian Ocean, it just disappears. Are you a glass or are you an ocean? Hmm. Right? So I think that what of all I would tell you, tell you, you know, I love my I love So at the end of the day, if, 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 if we could get up and make a bracha, Shalaya Sani Goy, on something that happens. Isn't that the most resilient thing that we could possibly do? Isn't that the greatest message of resilience? And I'll tell you personally that, you know, 
I was in the hotel business in a very big way in 09. And, you know, the world fell apart. Um, Citibank would have gone bankrupt without federal aid. They would take the stock went from 60 to one. Bank of America went bankrupt. Fannie Mae went bankrupt. Freddie Mac went bankrupt. Yes, Stearns went bankrupt. Lehman went bankrupt. And our hotel business went bankrupt. And you know what I did? I, I, I learned better those two or three years than I ever did in my life. I said, the world is falling apart. I said, I'm going to lock myself in my study. There's nothing I could do. Call me when there's something to do. And I took out all my friends. And, you know, I, I went through some of the, the second half of Chaysha Mishpat, which I have found excruciatingly hard to do. Those two years, that's what I did. So, so I think that as Yidin, you ask the question, and nobody should ever have these Nisyanis, or Rahman al Islam certainly losing a child like this guy did, or even going through Bizyanis and bankruptcies of companies and this and that. But at the end of the day, what are you? But if, if, if you can make the bracha shalaya sani ga, you're more resilient. So I salute that Katzke Hassan. I don't know his name, but I salute him. So, so you attach yourself to Hashem. You realize that you're... We're so much bigger than one thing. It's not just about Hashem because it's, it's, about, it's about a culture and, and our Shabbos table and our children. Right? What's the value of sitting with your child and, and, and learning the olive base or with a grandchild? What, what dollar value do you put on it? Some, I once heard over from Reb Nayak, he said to me, he said, imagine a person was on a, a desert island. You may have heard this. And they said to him, you could get off one day a year. Right? You could give a rap concert with a million people in attendance. Right? You could have some, your, your biggest Yetzirah you could sing, or you could spend it with your children. What would you do? We said there are things that are priceless that we don't really, and in our society where family is so important, where Torah is so important, where marriage is important, where parents are important, where Shabbos is so important, where community is so important. You know, you know so is it, are you an ocean or are you a glass? It's interesting you said that. I was, I was just meeting with an Almana, a young woman who lost her husband, tragically young, a dear friend of ours, a member of our community. And she was sharing with me, as, as many have, that if not for her children, she doesn't know she'd be able to get out of bed. And really, that's what you're saying, is that the loss of her husband is tragic and debilitating and paralyzing and horrific, but it's one component of who she is. And the, and the broader, bigger picture includes being a mother. And therefore, the broader, bigger picture demands that she continue to live and dig deep even if she didn't have the bigger picture and it were narrowed into only having been a wife, she wouldn't be able to get out of bed. That's what you're saying. That that business loss, that bankruptcy, that embarrassment, it's one component of who you are, a big one, maybe a deeply painful one, but the more that we broaden and zoom out the lens and the bigger that we see ourselves and the components of who we are, then that only becomes one piece of us. It doesn't have to take over the totality of us, which is an amazing insight. You know, I'll tell you a story that's, again, an extreme, but we could use it as a muscle. You know, the Rayats, the, the, the prior of Lubavitch Rebbe, he was interrogated by the KGB. This is, you know, before he left, he, had to, he actually ultimately fled and went to Rostov. And they put him in front of a firing squad. And they wanted him to confess to something. And they say that he told the firing squad, he said, your toys, he was referring to their guns, are frightening to people who live one life in one world. He said, I have many lives in many worlds, and I'm not scared of them. That's an extreme example, right? I don't know how many of us could do. But I think that how big, how big are you? How big is your world? How important is Shabbos to you? How important is sitting, again, what big enough is your grandfather now that sitting with a, a grandchild and trying to teach him comets alpha or getting to say that the alpha phase? But where does that put? And that's like, you know, I think that's... Do we do a good enough job teaching people that, right? In other words, you're obviously in the business world, you encounter that on a daily basis. Do we do a good enough job of instilling that in our yeshiva bacharim, high school students, college students, whatever world you live in, but as they're about to go into the world and experience these real life emuna challenges, do we do a good enough job of preparing them for what's coming down the pike? And is their emuna strong enough to deal with it? I mean, you're asking a very good question. Could our yeshivas do a better job 
of preparing people for the world. In other words, what, what the what the yeshivas, certainly the Haredi yeshivas, don't want to do is, quote unquote, create balabatim. They live with the echad yaitza principle. But, you know, could we do a better job of teaching chumash? I mean, I could tell you that most balabatim around the Shabbos table, if they had a vart on chumash, or a really understanding of the parsha would be much more meaningful than to say over, you know, a pshat and a machlekes tzayis in the sivis, right? Like the story of Rav Shach, the famous story, right? So, could we teach better chumash in yeshiva? Probably. Could we teach better emuna in yeshiva? Probably. But look, the yeshivas from when I went to yeshiva, when I was a kid, I could tell you, I went to a chesidish yeshiva that was the closest to my house, where every rebbe was there because he, he had gotten off the boat and he was, you know, he was willing to work for the least dollars the yeshiva could pay. And sometimes they spoke English and sometimes they didn't. We've come so far and, you know, in 40, 50 years. I mean, Jewish education in America started with my wife's grandfather, Trevor Feivel. Um, just studying English was a chiddush, right? He had to get letters from Chaim Meiza that they could teach English. So we've come so far. Can we get better? Yes. Will we get better? Absolutely. But we look forward in 20 years and say, wow, we've gotten so much better. Absolutely. Is this one of the areas that we could probably get better? I think they're experiencing it now. I think they're seeing that guys are going out to work and they're being successful. And nobody ever sat back and said, wait, how do you deal with success? We were always worried about the Cossack coming around the corner, the Bolshevik trying to kill you. Dealing with success is very foreign to Orthodox Judaism. As you know, um, if you look at the Ramba, the, look at the Paiskim. Um, how many raisins do you have to put into a liter of water so that if you boiled it, you could make a Bayer Priya right. Now, could you imagine somebody asking a child like that? Or the child of the Ridvaz and Hochaz Pesach, if you're starving, could you pour barley? into boiling water, and since there's a din of chalutin, so it's not nishamitz, and it prevents your, heart, your starvation and boil weed on pay. We don't have these shilas today. We have shilas of if you were successful, and now you have a private jet, is, and your next door neighbor is in Kailul, how do you deal with that? There's whole new shilas of Chuvas farm that will be written in Hashkafis farm, and we will write them. I always said the, the Tom Cheshabbos family today, the, the, the poorest families in our communities today, have air conditioning, their cars have power windows, their children have smartphones. And I don't mean to minimize the challenge that they're going through and the importance of the community taking care of them. But as you're describing, we don't really have starving, impoverished people today. Um, and I, hopefully that's a positive sign because the Jewish community you know, takes care of everybody. But what you're saying, we've seen empirically too. And, and you were saying one of the positives of the YU world is knowing a little bit how to integrate success. Um, and, and we've seen some of the, the more the people with a stronger yeshiva background who don't have the other worldliness exposure to it. And then they come into success and all of a sudden they're driving cars that and, and they're spending and they're plowing through that money. And there's no sense of how to integrate, how to save, how to live. And, and that's not part of the educational background. It's an important component to introduce for sure, as you're describing. So, so let me let me ask you another question. <clears throat> Unless Rabbi Brody wants to jump in, I don't want to uh, monopolize. But he'll, he'll think of his question while I'm asking this one. One of the things, Rabbi David, that I love about you is you're unpredictable. I love that you're very broad in your thinking. I love that you come from a yeshivish background, the yeshiva world. Uh, you've been you've learned in many of the great yeshivas. You're a litvasha individual. You're somebody who's enormous success in the business world. Not only have you written the three headline books. You've also written the, the Mishnah Achrona. You've written Svar. I'm curious which one you get more of a geschmack out of, the headlines or the Mishnah Achrona. But one of the things is, if a person listens to your show and just knows you, you're unpredictable. You're unpredictable where you come out on things. And you seem to draw really from the best of all worlds. You know, you, you mentioned to me recently, privately, how late at night you're stuck in a tosos, you call her Shechter. You recognize the godless of Gedolim in multiple worlds. You draw the greatness of multiple worlds. And you're a complicated person, which, which I love. Because I think, you know, it's that Shara Kolo, drawing from all Yudbe Shvatim, person who doesn't have to feel that they're locked into a box, locked into one path, they walk through one gate, they take the best of all worlds. When did that begin in your life? When you were a young man, when you were in yeshiva, when you were a younger man in Kov, when, when did that begin? Your curiosity, your insatiable appetite, your unpredictability that you might come out politically, 
People would not necessarily guess where you are politically. They wouldn't guess where you come out on Corona, given the community you're, you're living in. They wouldn't guess. You're unpredictable. Did that start for you at a young age? Did you build the confidence to have complicated, unpredictable opinions once you had the success? Did it precede it? Was it part of success? When, when did that come out? When did that emerge? So I, I know I'm going to be an impolite guest and say is I, I, I really don't like talking about myself. I, I would just say that, um, you know, we, again, I, I always go back to the parsha, which for me is a living document. There is a vart from the Chassam Saifa, a fabulous vart. It's worth saying, even though you've all heard it. It says by the, the Melech, he had a say for Tyra, and the Lashon Apostolic is, V'karu boy kol yume chayev. He used to read it in, well, every day of his life, and the Chassam Saifa learns, V'karu boy kol yume chayev. He would read in it the story of his life. And since the, the Melech is Libre Levav Kal Yisrael, I think each of us could learn Chumash and read our own story every week in the parsha. I would just say that, you know, when, when, when it comes to getting a bracha, Yitzchak precedes it. He wants to give over the whole bracha of Yitzchak L'chale Kim, the bracha of the future. He, he's giving it to Esav, he believes. But what, what does he say? He says, Sonna tell Yilcha the Kashtecha, right? Take your tools and capture something and make something varied and different and wonderful, make a feast. How does the beginning of bracha happen? When Yitzchak says, take your tools. And everybody, the Karab has to read this and say, the Torah is telling them, take your tools. Whatever God gave you, Whatever they may be, the Tsuda Litsayid Basay Limatam and Rubani Shalom tells you, take your tools and make me something varied and delicious according to your set of tools. And it's a very personal invitation. And it's this personal invitation that leads to the Bircha Sabram. So I don't know what my particular Tsuna Sanefish, I happen to be a student of Myers Briggs. And I know that there are 16 personalities that we're born with for the most part and that are not changeable, right? And they're out tchunas hanefesh. And, if we, and it's 16 divided by some say four. We have, so it could be 64 personalities. And whatever your personality is, that's what I would urge you. Sana tell yucha. If you want to reach the v'yit alucha birchas avram and you want to become a blessing, right? V'heyei bracha, take your tools. And your tools are going to be different than my tools. And you're going to have a different chunas on that fish. And we know that DNA tells us that there are no two people from the beginning of history till today that are the same. And Chazal said that thousands of years ago, and they said, Adam never yechidi. So there's, there's something that I think is an important message. I think that the only person we should copy, who we should Instagram, who we should be like really follow very avidly and compare ourselves to, is who we were last year and five years ago and 10 years ago and nobody else person should not compare themselves to anybody but they should avidly compare themselves to who they were and see are they why and they can't compare because it's a son or tell you so the answer is am i curious i mean these are all if i am don't learn from me you have your own tools and if i'm not don't learn from me and you have your tools and yours are unique and no two are ever going to be the same but celebrate your tools and the minute we start saying, what are you doing and how can I copy from you? We're sort of committing suicide to that one time event that is you, that never was before and never will be again. So do I compare myself to others? A absolutely. I compare myself to who I was a year ago and five years ago and 10 years ago and 30 years ago. And I see, I try to figure out, am I using my tools well? But I would never ask anybody to compare themselves to me or to anybody. And I hope I'm not being disrespectful, Rabbi Goldberg. No, no, not at all. And I'm going to push not to talk about you, but to talk about a view for the world, a hashkafa for the world, that, of course, we shouldn't compare ourselves to others. And what's working for you is not necessarily imposed or, or, or expected of others. But does it frustrate you? Do you believe the world should be um, more curious, more open to learning from broader swaths within the Shin Panama Torah, that the world should should be um, more united. People are very locked in. They're locked into their Rebbe, their Das Torah, their Yeshiva. 
and 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 maybe when they're exposed they're confused by that whereas you seem to be much more open and learning from others so is that something that's working for you that you I'll don't expect you, from others i'll tell you that <clears throat> look I, I i was lucky my parents sent me to the great yeshivas of the world right i mean i'm talking about you know the lakewoods the mirrors the brisks like were you the crossroads and then sometimes you meet somebody and i'm going to insult somebody here and say where did you learn I learned in uh, some yeshiva in New Jersey, yeah? And I went there, and my father was a shiva, and I was there from high school, and based medrash, and Kyle, and you just look at that person. And you know what? You're parochial. It's, you know, I have a driver, right? I, I do it out of necessity, because from the minute I sit down in the back, my, 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 my office is my seat, and my time is worth more than $25 or 30 whatever you pay a driver per hour, right? Now, going back a few decades, um, not, no, not really, how long has my son married? A decade. My son gets engaged to a girl from Montreal. So he's going there for Shabbos. Five and a half hours, he's coming back Friday, and, and I, I'm just a little bit worried about these long drives, leaving. So I asked my driver, who's a policeman, former policeman, retired, can you take him to Montreal? The guy's 60-something, right? 60 years old. And he says to me, I can't. I said, why? He says, I never had a passport. I said, you're 60. He says, no, I, I never really. I left New York twice. I once went with my wife to Philadelphia to a concert. And, and you look at such a person, what do you think? You're tiny. I mean, how do, how do we grow? I mean, the Jews were the, the cosmopolitan people of the world. The, the smarter, they always sat at the, wherever they were, became the crossroads of the world. You know, when, when, when I was in, <clears throat> in Spain with my wife and kids, we, so we went to the Alhambra, and they have over there a memorial where Isabella and, um, I forgot his name, what was Ferdinand. his name? Ferdinand. Ferdinand. We were interred for a while, and they made a shrine out of it. And I'm sitting there with the, with the shrine, and there's a whole bunch of you know, people from all over, and she's giving a speech, and she says, does anybody have a question? I, of course, you know. I said, you know, why did they make a shrine here? She says, oh, you, because of anti-Semitism? I said, forget about anti-Semitism. I said, D think of where Spain was in 1492, right? You had the Spanish Armada. You were the crossroads of the world, right? And what did you do? You got rid of the Jews. The head of finance, the head of banking, the head of poetry. And since then, Spain has only known that Europe goes there to get their tomatoes because it's warm. You... You sent away, you exported your intellectual capital. Imagine the destruction, right? When Jews were in Berlin, it was the center of the world. There were 22 Nobel Peace Prizes, not, not Peace Prize, Nobel laureates in Berlin over a 20 year period, almost all of them Jews, by the way. And when Hitler threw the Jews out, he asked the new uh, the the, the, uh, the the in the University of Berlin, you could Wikipedia this. They asked the new head of after we had got rid of how is math in the University of Berlin, and he said to Hitler, "There is no more math in the University of Berlin." Right? They got rid of their intellectual capital. And since the Jews left, what's what comes out of Germany? I don't know. They make worst of tried in knives and Mercedes. I mean, is the Mercedes meaningful in the world anymore? Where they send their intellectual capital to New York? and to Silicon Valley, and to Israel, et cetera, right? So we, all our wisdom has been, right? The great yeshiva, Surah and Pumpadisa. It wasn't some backwater little yeshiva, and I don't want to name any names. Where They're all good, but you never left there. All the wisdom comes from when you sit at a crossroads. So the minute where we say, we don't want to be a crossroads anymore, we don't want to learn from you, and we don't want to learn from you, we don't, what are we doing? We're basically becoming smaller. We're not forgetting... We're, 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 we start becoming parochial and tiny in a way. I love the image, a spiritual passport. You have to have a spiritual passport and travel. Yeah, still you, home. To, you come back we, home after you travel, but you have a passport. All the big Talmud Hachamim of the world learned in yeshivas, and they had people coming into them. And the, the minute we isolate, you know, we, we, we don't know who's going to be this. We don't know who the next guy in is going to be, right? Wow.
Really fantastic. Rav David, there's so much more to talk about, so many more questions to ask. You've been very generous with your time. We deeply, deeply appreciate it. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Mechila, if we pushed you to be personal, but there's a lot to learn from everyone. Rabbi Ephraim, it's been an honor to always to uh, to be with you and your wonderful, you know, Chaverim staff over here. And we always enjoy when we have you on. And when you said that comment about what happened by you and Chaim Kinevsky's out, out the room, our phones lit up. I think we got like 200 calls, 100 machas and 100 the other way, you know, which is hard. <laughs> I heard my, my daughter told me this morning. She, I didn't even know that people could call in to give comments or feedback. I didn't oh. know. She, they, didn't, they didn't like my car analogy that I don't think I'm welcome back by Reb Chaim. I got into some trouble. So hopefully you'll still talk to me. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure what happened there, but we are back and uh, grateful. David Luxenstein, fantastic <laughs> great conversation. Takeaways from the brilliant and great David Luxenstein. I'll tell you, wow. interesting, like Rav Waiwai, he sees everything through the prism of Torah. Everything is, let me tell you a vort. Let me tell you a story. Let me give you an insight. It's always all through the prism of Torah. Takeaways, Rabbi Brody, what jumped out at you from that conversation? I love the way he, he, right off the bat, he was just so uh, excited to talk about that opportunity to speak in front of that Kinnus uh, Ashluchim with Chabad. And anytime you get a chance for the Yeshivisha world to to uh, do something special with another big part of the Jewish world, I think it's fantastic. I love it. Rabbi Moskowitz. I loved his imagery of the small rock in a glass shatters it, but a big boulder in a large ocean barely makes a dent in the fact that we have to view ourselves as something bigger than ourselves and uh, not get thrown off by the bumps and the bruises and the adversity along the way. And obviously there was a lot of personal background to that as he was describing it, which he did not get into. But uh, if you followed the, the sub-narrative to it, it was definitely there. And um, I thought there was a, a lot about Emuna and about putting things in perspective in there. What about you, Rabbi Gober? He, first of all, he did allude to it, which was the man made and lost a billion dollars and then made twice that back. And that's to make it once is is uh, extraordinary to do it twice and to come back. And to say that in between, I had my best learning ever. I wasn't distracted. Talk yeah. about imagery. Talk about imagery. He says, he says, yeah, the economy collapsed. I'll be learning. If the economy comes back, let me know. <laughs> And when there's a deal to be made, come find yeah, me. There's a deal to be made, find me. Uh, the most most impactful to me is the fact that he wouldn't talk about himself. When he asked me before he came on, what are we going to talk about? I said, you know, your background, your story, your life. He said, that's very American to talk about yourself. I don't believe in that. That's not the Torah. Sorry. But no, no, don't worry. We won't talk about you. And then tonight also he pushed back and he's like, I'm not talking about me. It's a very American thing to talk about you. I don't talk about me. I tell you, I'm safer. I tell you, I tell you, Chabura topic. I don't want to talk about me. So even more than anything in particular that he said was what he didn't say, what he refused to say, where he wouldn't go was, I don't want to talk about me. I, you know, when I, when we promote the uh, behind the Bima, the people who help us, they look to link whoever our guest is. You won't find him online. His headline speaks for him. Oh. And, uh, you know, he doesn't talk about him. Life for him is not about selfie. It's not about tag me. It's not about promote me. It's about ideas. He talks about ideas, not people. Impressive, very, very impressive. Self, I thought you would say brilliant. spiritual passport. I love that. Yeah, that's the other part. I know you love that also. It gave me no vocabulary because we talk all the time about the Shara Kolal don't lock ourselves in, put me in a box when I'm dead, to be able to travel in between the 12 gates, the Shvatim and the Shara Portal, Kolal, the gate. portals of, of entry. Yeah, those, so yeah. so he gave us a vocabulary of a new description, and he's right. The people who say, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm 60, 70, 80 years old, I don't own a passport, I've never left the country, I've never seen anything on the other side of the Hudson. So, you know, there are people religiously who are like that. They've never seen anything on the other side of where they live. Spiritual passport. And you can't travel to a dangerous neighborhood with your passport. You got to know where you can go. But, and, and you come home, you don't necessarily travel and stay there permanently. There's there's a whole, you could expand that image of the spiritual passport. There's an article there. There's, a there's an article there. <laughs> there's for sure an article of the spiritual passport. So it was it was a great conversation. It was a good that's, conversation. That's the, that's the title of your uh, Elo brochure next year. Your spiritual, spiritual passport. passport. Not I bad. Like that. Not what bad. I didn't have the guts to ask him, but I want to ask him is um, he's, he's accomplished and he's financially independent and wealthy. And what impact 
do those have on his confidence in taking positions controversial and popular? For example, he's politically left-leaning. He's, he's more liberal, certainly, than the yeshivish world that he comes from or that he, to a certain extent, still lives in. But he's not afraid. He's not afraid to have those positions. He's not afraid to go to YU, go here, go there, wherever he wants to go. Um, he told me, I don't, I don't think he'd be upset that I repeat this, when I asked to come on, he said, how could I say no to you? You always come on my show. He goes, for example, and why you asked me to come for Shabbos, how could I say no? Who do I call at 12 o'clock at night when I'm working on a Tosavos? There's only one person in America I could call, Rav Shechter. Whatever Tosavos, I'm mugging up from. But he goes, whatever obscure uh, source that I'm working on, Shechter's holding in it. So when they asked me to come, how could I say no? How could I say no to you? I love that. He calls Rav Shechter to talk and learning at midnight because there's a Tosavos, the mugging up from 11, 11, 30, midnight. So just the image is, is is great. There's a lot to learn from him. A lot to learn. And Rabbi Brody wants to learn how do you become a financially independent and wealthy. Exactly. <laughs> there's a lot, it's a lot bigger to learn from him too. A lot in the Jewish news this uh this week. Some sad, some tragic, some scary. Somebody somebody raised a very good question, which is when did Jewish media become an outlet for news? More than just the Jewish community. But when did these Jewish magazines start being political pundits and analysts? And when did Jewish breaking news, who are, who's guiding them on what's Lashon Hara, what's gossip, what's permissible to share, not permissible to share? A popular children's author, author from Israel. Accusations were made. Nothing's been substantiated. Eichler took his books off the shelves. I saw another Gadol said to put them in storage, meaning don't throw them out, but don't leave them on the shelf. We have to wait to see how this pans out. It's interesting. But so Jewish websites break that news. Is that... Is there is there a psak? Is that a do they ask a question? Should they can they be breaking that news? Should we who get these alerts in WhatsApp or whatever means we get alerts from Jewish breaking no news? Alerts. So I'm saying is the Jewish breaking news, God forbid there are rockets at Israel, so we could say to Hillam, yeah. or is Jewish breaking news a scandal in the Jewish community or controversy in the Jewish community or splintering within a Hasidic group of the Jewish community? Who's determining what should qualify as Jewish breaking news? Tell you the truth. I was watching a show the other day. It says, what, what should really qualify as news? If you look at what's on the average news station right now, you say, what, why is that news? Yeah. You know, it's it's, it's strange what we, we've been told is news right now or newsworthy. Yeah, you know, the news is steering your mind and yeah. distracting from other things and deciding what we should be thinking and talking about. But there was something else. It, one of our, Yeah, go ahead. And there are articles that stimulated a lot of controversy. Not controversy, but very, I think, important conversation. That was a letter to the editor of Mishpacha magazine. Mishpacha, really Besser, had written an article that um, someone followed up with a letter to the editor about Ben Azmanim, Yeshiva Bacharim, challenges of learning Gemara and staying um, inspired. A Rebbe, Rebbe Weinberger, who's twice guest on Behind the Bima, had a, I don't know, a sheer, a schmooze, I don't know what you call it, but he was on fire. I mean, mamish on fire about that topic. Um, what do you, what do you, what's your take on it, Rabbi Gober? If you can give our listeners some of the background and then a little bit of perspective on it as well. Well, it's really Besser, a dear friend, and also a past guest on, on Behind the Bima, basically the who's who of the Jewish world, the non-Jewish world's been on, on Behind the Bima. Next week, we have a big guest I'm so excited for, Rav Machlis, the great Sadek of Yushalayim, and a whole story of how we got him because it was not simple. Uh, he, he, what a special Jew. Um, so it's really Besser wrote an article after Sukkot that basically said, Yeshiva Bachram, guys in Yeshiva work really hard in Yeshiva. When you catch them during Ben Azmanim, slipping in, wandering around, doing activities, you may not expect the Yeshiva Bachram. Cut them some slack. They work very hard. This really is in some ways the Rebbe Yitzchak of our day. He often takes a contrarian underdog, defends people uh, position. Um, and there was a strong reaction. Letters continue to flood in from that, including a Yeshiva Bachram himself saying, if you find people who have a Ben Azmanim problem, it's because they have a Zman problem. The guy who's who's going to the 10 o'clock minion ben Azmanim, it's not because he's going to the 6 a.m. minion during this man. And there was a big discussion back and forth, and Rav Weinberger went off on it and talked about a yeshiva system that is designed for the ones who are excellent. It's designed for those who are engaged, designed for the one who can sit and study. And I thought one of his powerful lines is, he said, it's not that there are boys falling through the cracks. There are gaping holes, and we're pushing boys out of them, through right. them. Um, so I, I don't know how much that applies to the whole Orthodox world. There's segments of the Orthodox world that doesn't apply. We had a conversation yesterday, two days ago in Moscow. It's the Tzad Shava, the common denominator in, you can call it the more modern world, the more yeshivish world, is if there's not a hardcore relationship with God, if there's not a feeling that I'm in a relationship, 
there's not a palpable connection, communication, expectations. If I don't feel his love, his affection, if I don't feel the expectations he has of me that I have to meet, that he's watching me, that he's holding me, that he's supporting me, the good, the bad, every component of being in a real, actual, vibrant, dynamic, authentic relationship, then it won't last. So Moish Bain was, was here this past Shabbos. And um, we did a conversation Shabbos afternoon, the state of orthodoxy. And I asked him about modern orthodox kids and secular campuses. Rumor has it DOU has some data and research on it they haven't published about the kids who go to these college campuses and what level of are they still keeping Shabbos kosher and so on. And his answer was he also had concerns. OU provides JLIC, wonderful rabbinic couples who are really important to the Jewish kids on campus. And they do phenomenal work and they deserve our support and our, our gratitude. Um, but by placing those couples there, are we encouraging more kids from observant backgrounds to go to campuses where they may struggle to maintain their observance? And he said he also thought that these kids go to college campus and lose their passion, lose the enthusiasm, lose the observance. He said he realized it wasn't in college. And then he thought it was in high school. That's where they are teenagers, adolescents, curious, exploring. And he realized it's not in high school. He realized it's in middle school. If parents are not letting a father under a child, if the middle school kid doesn't think, I have an identity, I have a responsibility, I am part of a mission, I have a destiny, I'm in a relationship with Hashem, there are consequences to my choices. And that's not to say that every middle schooler is going to be on fire religiously, but if we're not shaping and molding and laying, dropping a, a strong anchor at that age in middle school already, then by the time they get to college, it's hopeless, it's helpless, they're lost. So th there's a common denominator between the yeshiva guy who doesn't fit in or the kid who's already on their way to choosing a campus where they can leave religion behind. And the common theme to both is, are we in a vibrant, dynamic, real, palpable relationship with God? No, 100%. That was the exact debate that you and I had earlier this week. I'll just add that, you know, the other common denominator is Gemara learning. And I think we don't often talk about this enough, but Gemara learning is such a central component, obviously, of and if you're a child, a male child growing up through middle school, high school, yeshiva, kola, whatever system you're in, modern Orthodox, Haredi, Gemara is so central to that experience. And yet, in 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 Rav Weinberger spoke about this. It's really hard, right? And for as you said, it's almost like an elitist system. Like if, if you get Gemara and you're academically inclined, inclined. for it and, yeah. and you're able to tap into it, you could find that Kishmak, you could find that inspiration with a Gemara. But you have to be really willing to dive into it. You can't dabble in Gemara and find the meaning. You can dabble in davening and still connect to it because at the end of the day, there are going to be things you're going to need in your life and you're going to find that conversation with God. And it might not be all the time, but it might be in the Elah and it might be a, you know, there'll be pockets throughout the year where I think anyone can relate to davening. Someone's sick, you need Parnassah, whatever the case might be. But Gemara learning as the central component of a yeshiva system is very, very challenging. And... Um, and again, I don't, I don't know a good answer to it. Like that's just how the system works. One second, but let me let me cut you off because is it challenging? It is challenging. It's an Aramaic and it's esoteric, and sometimes it's intellectually complicated. But is part of why it's challenging is because we're asking our kids to do things that they don't ever see their father or their parents or their siblings do once they're no longer in school. Meaning, why is it in the yeshiva world that the young guy, it's it's like the air you breathe, it's a given. That's not to suggest that every young yeshiva guy loves learning or is doing it beyond school, but it's it's a given. What a, what a secular education is to a modern Jew, that it's a non-negotiable, you're going to learn to read and write and, and math and some basic liberal arts education. So that's what Gemara is. It's, it's non-negotiable. It's not debatable. You're going to do it. You may not keep up with it forever, but that's part of the fabric of who we are. So it's part of when you say it's challenged to have it at the core of the Judaic curriculum, is, is part of that challenge that that child is being told that that this is part of the essence of your life. It's your passport to travel spiritually. And yet you don't ever see or rarely see um, the people around you who are your role models still doing No, it? so correct. I think in our world, that is definitely a challenge. I was sharing with you earlier this week as well. My nephew is in Yeshiva in Mansi, and they made a Nassim on Adharam. And my wife and I and my children were sitting there watching the Nassim, and we were in tears. It was the most beautiful thing in the world, how the Rebbe's Dance the boys up who were making the siyum, how the Rebbe, yeah, it was just, it was amazing. And the chashivas, the importance of Torah that they gave in the slavas, the hergish, like the feeling that was behind it was, was palpable and it was contagious. It was amazing, right? So yes, a hundred percent. But I will say, and I think Rav Weinberger spoke about this as well, even in the yeshivish world, right? 
not everyone is is cut out for it. Not everyone is cut out to sit for that long. Not everyone has the head for it. Certainly, if it comes to learning in Kolel for years past, a basic base measure system, not everyone has that capacity, was given those tools. And some people would be better off in a work-learn environment, which like a YU system would promote. So I'm not saying there's one system that's perfect, but Gemara learning is really hard. Whether yeah. you're in the yeshivish oh, oh. world and it requires hours of sitting and, and focus, or whether you're in the modern Orthodox world and it's not as natural of a vocabulary for you and you're always kind of playing catch up to that system, but it's really hard. I'm not saying that's the root cause. I'm saying that's definitely, I think, a component of it, though. Rabbi yeah. Brody. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, there are, are, are Ner Yisrael represented. Ner Yisrael, I will say that that <laughs> I struggled in high school with Gemara. I, 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 I could, couldn't figure it out. And even when I got to Ner Yisrael, I remember when they were studying, um, when I first got there, it was Nadarim. And I just, I couldn't understand. I couldn't make sense of Nadarim. The Jewish food the Nadarim. And then I found Rabbi Fran, and he was doing some stuff which I could make sense of, you know, in terms of just practical halachic analysis, Shabbos, Brachas, Sachim, and things like that. And then, but even to this day, it's just, I, I, I find a lot more enjoyment doing other parts of, you, you know, halacha. I love studying halacha. I love studying other parts. I just don't get it. I just don't get, I cannot wrap my head around the, the analysis in Gemara. I, I love but it. The, yeah, but the Sea you of know? Talmud is a very big place. The Sea of Talmud is enormous and, and you can swim in different parts of it, like you say. They're more esoteric. There's Agarata. There's the Jewish law parts. I, I was at a Siam very recently, very recently, of, of uh, a young person, which just means he's younger than I am, who this is his second Masechta that he's finished. And at both of the Siams he made, he spoke about how he doesn't love learning, doesn't like learning at all, but pushes himself to do it because he knows that that's the anchor. To be an observant Jew, one of the building blocks, one of the foundational blocks of what it means is to be learning. So there's a difference between saying I'm staying and learning for three, four, five, six, eight hours a day, or say I'm going to do a daf yomi, I'm going to listen, or I'm going to use the article, it's going to be an aid, it's going to help me. There are amazing, Rabbi Eli Stefanski, what he's built online is, is tremendous. Um, there, there are all new Magide Shir, including you know, Shalom Rosner, some of the classics, Rabbi Elephant, and some of the most popular ones around the world. Um, there, there are fantastic. Uh, really Bornstein, a new Sorry, amazing daf. I'm, I'm enjoying a lot. His, his raid bites. So, you know, the question. Right, but is, I'm just saying, is it, but you're, coming from, you're coming from a very different perspective. That's my point. I think that's what maybe what Rabbi Moss. No, no, but the guy, the guy, the guy. I, I, I listen to Rabbi Rosner. I love him. He's great. I just don't. Right. I can't. No, so, so it, one it, second. It just Should doesn't... you do something that you don't enjoy? Let's say. Right. So I go to my Rabbi Grossman. I have a sheer every single week. My Rebbe from there, Jake. I'm every week. I'm, I'm we're, we're learning Baba Metzia. I just Good, don't, so I still don't, right, I'm doing it, but I, I, I'm telling you, I don't get it. But who says you have to enjoy? The, no, it's not about I'm enjoying, sure. I just don't, I don't, I can't explain it. I just don't know. No, understand. but here's, no, here's so the, the point. It point, takes Rabbi. me a that, lot longer to understand what he's trying to say, whereas the for, for, one person no, will I'll, get it hold right Hold on, let me, make, let me make my point and then, and then you can push back, which is, I've tried a lot of different forms of exercise. I tried to be a runner. You're a big runner. Both of you have run. Moscow Center is an active runner. And you get into the runners, uh, whatever, and you love it, and you can't stop. And you, I, I, I've heard the whole runner. I thought I would be like, I tried, and I lied to myself, and I faked it. And all I did was hear my heart pounding through my chest and chest and desperately wanted it to end and would give anything until it was over. And I've tried all kinds of forms of exercise. And now I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, I don't like it, but I've got to do it. Whether it's r running or bike riding or lunges and and uh, – and uh, that's where I'll squats, challenge you. But that's whatever you got to do. But like, if you want to be healthy, you've got to do it. And you're right. You find the one you enjoy the most. But even if you don't enjoy it, you've got to do it. And some would argue that no, learning Torah every day right. is, is you got to find it's, what so you I love agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I agree with you 100%. Right? We have, right? That They say about um, about uh, Rav Kanievsky, I think, that he used to call, or Rav Yashiv, that he used to call it his chovos. Right, that is learning yeah, obligations. Time, he used to time, call them yeah. the schovos. Why? Because it was a chiyav. In other words, I have obligations. I have to earn a parna. Like there are things I have to do, so I have to learn, whether I like it or not. But but for a guy who's not as committed as Rechaim Kenievsky, right? And and if you don't do something that you enjoy, unless you're a really disciplined person, like you are, you're going to drop out. And no. you know that about exercise. No, I'll tell you. No. I'll tell you how I know that. A millennial I, mindset. Every, no, it's no, a Rabbi. Every diet, mindset. Rabbi, I've and I have to enjoy everything I do. Okay, but let's say it's a millennial mindset. Those are the guys in Shiva now. But those are the guys in Shiva now. Saying, Rabbi, look, I change. know from you, I know from you that if you exercise you don't enjoy, I'm talking about Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, exercise yeah. you don't enjoy and diets that you don't enjoy, 
you'll do it for a month. You might do it for two months. Josh Brody, you know this is true, but you're going to drop off, right? Think about the exercise you enjoy. Tennis is the only one you do because you enjoy it. No, it's no, very still, hard. I still, unless my, you're... I still ride my bike. Okay. But I'm saying unless you're all in, it's very hard to commit yourself to something you don't get a geschmack out of. And if and if Gemara becomes no, no, just that's, a that's, chova I'm gonna, to you. I'm going to play the role of David Lucasy. That's an American mindset. It's an American but, mindset. Okay. To let's, I agree with you. I'm saying, to be a fromier, who said you have to – like I also go to many. I also daven. I don't every day enjoy the – I don't want to daven. I don't enjoy the daven. I there are components of things that we do. I agree with you in principle. Of course I agree with you in principle. But I'm telling you, Lemaisa, Matthias, practically, right? What Rev Weinberger was describing, I think, is a component of this, which you have millennial we people. We got to do both. So the one who's not enjoying and therefore not engaged, we still have to show him love, bring him in, give him that inspiration, create the platform, the community. I totally, totally agree. I, I, I loved his talk. I was moved by it. The, the best part of Rev Weinberger, if a person hasn't listened to it, is – is how genuine it is from him. Like he loves these boys and he feels that nobody else is, is their voice is advocating for him. And you hear that passion. He's like, he can't help himself. He just unloads about it. It's like it is kishkas. And that's amazingly impressive. So I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. My point is that part of, I think what we need to do is reeducate from a very young age, go back to Mosh Bain from middle school, from before middle school and re-engage and say, I don't, I don't like to brush my teeth either. I don't want to brush my teeth. Yeah, we fight with our kids when they're very young. I don't want to shower. I don't shower. We teach them that there are things. Who cares if you want to do it? You have to do it. There are things you have to do. If you don't, even if you don't, who says the barometer, the metric, the measure is what I enjoy? So that's what I'm so <laughs> impressed by. This young person who had a second see him, and and he's like, I fought through my whole life. His first see him was in his mid thirties, closer to forty. And the second see him is, it, it, it's it's impressive. He's like, I don't enjoy it, but I've come to the conclusion that to have an anchor and to be part of a community that I want to be part of. The entry fee is learning every day. So I don't necessarily Listen, enjoy it. Right, I think that's what I, you got to do. Yeah, but I think you're missing the point. I'm just going to push back a drop. Go, with, push. With all, with all due respect. Push. It's not, it's not enjoying uh, uh -oh. it. No, you know it's what, not. You know what no, you say with all due respect. Due respect means you have to give me no yeah, respect. Let me tell you something. No, because I, I, I'm, I'm being honest here. Is that it's, it's not about enjoying or not enjoying. It's about understanding versus not understanding. When you listen to a shear, let's just say, whoever your Rosh Hashiva is or whoever your Magid shear is, and you get it. Or you're listening to right. a Gemara, someone's reading you Gemara, or you are reading the Gemara and you get it. You just you 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 read it and you understand it. It's amazing. But for oh, someone no, no, else, I'm with you. I'm someone with you. else that has to do it five times just to just to understand what what it is we're talking about, it, it is very, very frustrating. Uh, I'm with you. I'm with you. So first of all, maybe maybe there's a different way to engage it. You could learn so yeah, give you instead of learning the Gemara straight. You could learn it conceptually, or even what Davlik was saying, you could learn it as a contemporary halacha. Here are fascinating halachic dilemmas. You know, what if, what the, the Rav Zilberstein books that have been translated into English, here's an amazing dilemma based on the parsha, and then it grabs Gemaras and it grabs uh, Poskim. And, and so I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not talking about the format, and I'm not talking about exactly which Masechta or which Sugya. Right, but the way I'm it's the taught, notion it's, that, there's yeah, I understand. It's, it's one I, way right now. I just got a text but, from a, a colleague and friend who says, in, in Hasidus Chabad, it's called Kabbalah's Ol in Gishmak. It's a Kabbalah's Ol in Gishmak. I have to do it. It's a non-negotiable. And I'm going to try to do it with a gishmak. I, so, I, I, Rabbi Brody, I, I, I sympathize. I understand. And find the one that's accessible, that's meaningful, that's pleasant. I right, got but it. If they're not, I no, no, no. No, but the point is, if they're not presenting that in the yeshiva you're in, then what are you supposed to do? You're just a right, I was going to say, you Rabbi Brody, that's, that's the point. In other words, okay, you can't go and argue. It's not the setting system. it up that way. And I'll give you the biggest proof. I want to share two ideas. Number one is the biggest proof is smichas chaver, right? The reason oh. why you have guys who, who, who never saw themselves as learners Joining smicha schaver is not because they're getting a geshmak at a gemara. It's because right. it's being packaged in a way that they can understand it. It's relatable to them, and they can take it home with them. And they so, would say if they were only taught it like that in that way correct. back then, they would, they say, would if, have if loved. This was my high it. school. Right. If this was my right. yeshiva, I would have been exactly. into learning a lot earlier. Right. That's number right. one. Number two is when Rabbi Left here was here for Shabbos about two or three years ago. He said he said an idea which was so profound. He said, we think Judaism has to be fun. We teach our children it has to be fun. Judaism has to be fun. Mitzvahs have to be fun. Learning has to be fun. He says, spoiler alert, Judaism is not fun. He said, but it's worth it. He said, we have to teach our children that Judaism might not be fun, but it's worth it. And I think that's the, that's the key here, right? Gemara might not be fun, but it's worth it. For me, it's so tragic when dads, sometimes fathers, you know, because my son's in middle school, fathers will come over to me. They'll say, you know, Rabbi, can you help me with a Mishnah? Can you, can you introduce me to how, what a Gemara looks like? I say, yeah, what, what's the interest? 
They said, because my son's starting to learn in, in school and I feel so pathetic that I can't even open up the book that he's learning. I can't learn a Mishnah with him. Right. I can't learn a Gemara with him. I don't even know what the right. Gemara looks like. To me, that's sad and tragic and 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 we have to do a better job of educating. So I, let me just clarify my position. And, and anyone who knows Bogart's own synagogue and our programming knows how devoted we are to getting creative and creating diverse opportunities to learn and engaging people at all levels and with all curiosities. Of course, I believe that. I'm not suggesting that we lock people in a room with a Gemara and force them to learn things that they struggle to understand. Anyone who knows me knows us, knows I believe that. The point that I'm making is that if we start to say that something I don't enjoy, I don't have to do, then what's next? I remember a group of boys I spoke to, we've talked about this before, I think I'm behind the beam as well, that I don't enjoy putting on tefillin. Tefillin doesn't, tefillin doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't do anything for me. So if I don't have to learn, because learning doesn't do anything for me, then why should I have to put on tefillin? Tefillin don't do anything for me. And, and where do we go from there? And so I think at a very young age, we have to talk about, we're going to try to make it do something for you. We're going to teach the gishmak. We're going to get the deeper reasons. We're going to touch the neshama. Of course, we're gonna, but you know, when all said and done, if we fail, you still have to do it. You still have to do it. You got to put on tefillin. And, and I think it's important that in the broad spectrum and all of the gates of the Orthodox community, the Torah learning should be a priority, should be a given. And we shouldn't expect our children to enjoy learning long-term if they don't see a priority uh, in their own family of learning long-term. But I want to go back to the way we began and we'll end with this. Here's a question, Rabbi Moskowitz. Here's a question because I've been getting some messages about this. And everyone feel free. Those who are on live, we had a great, great crowd tonight. Those listening later, we'd love to see your comments and and please uh, rate and review online. Rabbi Moskowitz, somebody says to you, I'm giving you $2,500 to be used to promote something that you do. You can't spread it out over many things you do. You have to use it to market one thing you do. You could take out Google ads, YouTube ads, Facebook ads. You could have print things and deliver them uh, glossy postcards to a zip code, whatever it is. We're going to do targeted promotion marketing for one thing you do. Are you spending it on behind the beam? What are you spending that on? Sure. No, no, you, you do something you do. It can't be used on Booker's and Synagogue. I told you, I already told you it's my Tillum class. I am most proud of my Tillum class. I think, first of all, it happens to be if you go online, there's not a ton about on Tillum. It's very hard to find some stuff on Tillum. Rabbi Yaakov Trump, when he was doing his Nachiomi, did a little bit on Tillum. You don't have full series on Tillum to the extent that you have of either other areas of Tanakh and Gemara learning. It, it, it's not a very populated area. Um, for me, as a male who went through a yeshiva system that was highly Gemara focused, you, you might say a couple of Prakam of Tehillim here and there, but studying Tehillim, really delving into it, understanding the themes of the Meforshim. You know, part of what I love is, again, I think we're like 96, 97, 98, whatever Shiram into Tehillim, is you see themes. Like the Radak and the Malbim understand most Prakam the same way, but very different from one another. So I can open up pretty much any Parakatilim now, and I can anticipate what the Radak is going to say and what the Malbim is going to say, and they're going to be very different. But because I have that flavor now, I'm able to appreciate that. I love that. And I, I see it from the people that are in the class. They love it. I challenge them every week. I say, whatever Parak we're learning this week, I want you to make that your Parak. No, don't just, this is not just a class. It's not just like, oh, the Radak says this and Rashi says this. I said, I want you to go home. And throughout the week, I want you to, 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 to savor this parakatilim. I want you to enjoy it. I want you to say it. I want you to perseverate over it. I want you to think about it. I want it to become part of you for that week. And the feedback I get is that people respond to it because it's not a language that's oftentimes spoken, so certainly let, from a male rabbi. Let's practice what we preach. Rabbi Moskowitz, let our audience know where they can learn Torah with you. When do you teach and how can they find you? All my past year, my Wayu Torah, you could search my name on wayutorah.org. I teach a Tehillim class on Thursday mornings, 9.30 a.m., Boca Raton Synagogue. We have coffee, we have water, we have granola bars, and we have a really good time. It's a great group of people. It's Where social. can they find it it's online? Learning. On Wayu Torah afterwards? Wayu Torah afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's great. on Zoom for those who are not able to attend in person. Fantastic. What else are you doing? Oh, I'll hear out Rabbi Brody. You What's no, no, Friday, me? Friday, you Friday, you Friday. We got well. my three ideas in thirty minutes. On uh, do three ideas on the parsha. Also, great attendance to that. Really great feedback with that. Also, when and the whole that? goal How there. Can they find it all on www.brsonline slash Rabbi Moskowitz nine thirty a.m. The best part about that, and I tell I tell all the participants, it's not for me to share like esoteric vortlech with you. 
I want to do one of two things, either something that you can directly deliver at your Shabbos table, like a deliverable idea, something that's short, concise, you're going to remember it, you're going to bring it to your Shabbos table, and that's going to be your Dvar Torah, or something that I believe will stimulate conversation at the Shabbos table. So maybe it's a part of the Parsha that's oftentimes overlooked or an idea which I think can be broadened and stimulate an important conversation. So I'm not just trying to find like random ideas, but I'm trying to really zone in on one of two things, either deliverable ideas or ideas that I think are going to spark meaningful conversations at the Shabbos table. So And, and the men's afternoon call as, as well. I just want to point out that after the interview, we're like, it's already late. Why don't we wrap this up? We'll talk for like two minutes and we'll wrap up the episode, make it close to an hour. <laughs> and and we're, we're closing in on two hours. Rabbi Brody used to give the, the tefillah insights. People yeah, who want to learn with you or want to want to be inspired by you, tell us, about Friday Night Live. Tell us what you're doing right Friday now. Friday Night Live, we're doing a whole reboot. It's coming back in person. And we also still do. We're actually doing two Friday Night Lives every week, one in person and one, one on Zoom. But I'm actually starting a new course. It's called Foundation Circles with Momentum. It's Foundation Circles are about gaining Jewish literacy for life. And it's an inaugural series. It's starting in about two weeks. And um, what is the PR? About- I PR just got King. it. I just got it. Yeah, I haven't posted where, where, anything anywhere. Could, somebody who wants to join. All you got to do is go to. Yeah, very, very easy. First of all, it provides a preview of Jewish text, its historical periods, major works, and primary genres. So uh, it's amazing. Very, I'm just reading that right here. It's you just had that off the top of your tongue. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just reading it right off the off the flyer. It's a great flyer. It's circles.momentumunlimited.org. Circles.momentumunlimited.org. Okay, cool. Nine, and I invite everyone. People learn with you. I invite everyone to come learn together on Tuesday mornings. We have a partial class at 9.30 a.m. It's on YouTube, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg. You can find all the classes. You can watch them live. They're streamed. You can watch them later. Of course, we invite people in person and prefer. It's uh, primarily directed to an experience of people in person. Partial class 9.30 on Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning at 8.15. We do 10 minutes of Masih Sasharam at 8.45, living with Emuna. Of course, uh, 9 p.m. Wednesday nights, we have our Behind the Bima, but we're not promoting that. Six-minute sitter snippets between Menach and Marav, most evenings, and also available online. And you can find all these on podcast players, Torah, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg.org, YouTube.com, slash Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, our weekly, the articles that we're all writing. And um, we're, we're not self-promoting. We are making clear to our children that as proud as we are behind the Bima, teaching Torah is the core of who we are and what we are and what we do. None of them are a contradiction to one another. It all complements one another. This too is a form of teaching Torah, spread, spreading the ideas of Torah. So we look forward to welcoming people to learning with I us. I will say that now, now that my son's getting a little older and and I'd say a little bit more um, aware of the world and willing to push back, I think we're ready to have the kids on. I think we're, we're getting really? there of like a real, the Rabbi's children raw, episode? authentic Rabbi's Children episode. I think Moshe's there. He's ready. So- my son and I learn learn Mishnah every night. We're part of this program. The community has a beautiful program in the shul that um, four Mishnah is a day, Sunday through Thursday, Friday, Shabbos, you review. It's a four-year program, and we're at the very beginning of it, so I'm certainly not spiking any ball yet, but scheduled, please God, to be able to make a siyam for his bar mitzvah. So he said to me tonight when we're learning our four Mishnahs of Demai, which you talk about challenge to connect with, like, you know, pay a Demai. These are rough. Rough, rough, rough. So he said to me, Abba, you remember when I spoke at your Siyam Ashas, I learned the press Dafyomi. And after the last uh, cycle of the Dafyomi, we made a Siyam Ashas. And he was uh, six years old, seven years old at the time. And he he spoke. It was the cutest and sweetest, most adorable thing ever. He said, are you going to speak at my Siyam Ashas? Yeah. I said, yeah, it'll be your bar mitzvah. I hope I will. He goes, are you going to feel bad that I finished Shas before becoming a rabbi and you only finished it after <laughs> becoming a rabbi? Nice. That's what I'm so, telling you. We're ready. Yeah, it's We're nice. Ready. When when your son's trash talking with you about Torah, it's a nice thing. It's a good level. It's nice. He meant oh, it in sure. the cutest way. So a uh, great conversation tonight. I hope we stimulate all the thinking within ourselves and among others. Thank you again to David Lichtenstein. Looking forward to next week. Welcoming the Tzaddik. Amazing. A tzaddik in our time. I don't think it's an exaggeration to describe the Machlis as that way. Unless, unless he hears that and then he won't be on. So don't tell him we described him that way. But we're looking forward to next week. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and stay holy.